Let us journey back to the age of castles and chivalry, where knights, both feared on the battlefield and admired off it, were the pinnacle of medieval society. To join their ranks was a formidable quest, for the elite intended to keep their status exclusive. Becoming a knight was no ordinary endeavor, it was a lifelong pursuit. It began early, typically when a young lad was just seven to ten years old. At this tender age, they became pages, learning the arts of handling horses, hunting, and practicing with mock weapons while serving a knight. Around age 14, these aspiring knights advanced to squires, or esquires. Now, their responsibilities increased significantly. They wielded real weapons, began a more formal education, including the study of chivalry, and assisted knights both in times of peace and on the battlefield. This often involved tasks such as carrying extra lances and shields, maintaining the knight's armor, and tending to their numerous horses. If these young squires persevered, around the age of 18, they could partake in a grand ceremony known as a dubbing. Preparations for this momentous event were meticulous. They had to take a thorough bath and maintain an overnight church vigil. On the day of the dubbing, the squire was dressed in white, symbolizing purity. He wore a white belt, black or brown stockings, and a scarlet cloak, representing the earth from which all life springs and the blood he was now ready to shed in the service of his baron, sovereign, and church. His sword, now blessed by a priest, was handed back to him with a solemn reminder to always protect the poor and weak. This unique sword had two cutting edges, one representing justice and the other loyalty and chivalry. The honor of knighthood could be bestowed by a knight who had already achieved that status. They might affix a spur to the squire's heel or place the sword and belt upon him. A kiss on the cheek symbolized brotherhood and camaraderie. The dubbing itself was a moment of profound importance. It involved a simple tap on the shoulders or neck, a touch of the hand or the sword, or even a formidable blow, known as accolade, a reminder of the squire's moral duty not to disgrace the knight who had given him this honor and to uphold the chivalric code. The newly minted knight was then given a horse, a shield, and a banner that often bore his family's coat of arms. The grand ceremony was concluded with a sumptuous feast, a celebration of their noble journey. In the earlier days of knighthood, these noble warriors could come from various backgrounds, requiring only courage and determination. Many received their title on the battlefield, granted by a lord or monarch as a reward for valor and exceptional service. This symbolic honor was often presented in the form of spurs, hence the saying to win one's spurs. However, by the 13th century, the majority of knights were the sons of knights, a sign of the class's attempt to safeguard its exclusivity in society. In the age of knights, a warrior's journey was more than a path to valor, it was a life dedicated to mastering the arts of combat. To don the title of knight, one had to excel in the use of weapons, understand the art of armor, and undertake rigorous training. The essence of a knight lay in his skill with weapons, his trusty steed, and his unwavering valor. He had to be a true equestrian, guiding his horse with knees and feet, all while clutching a triangular leather and wood shield, carrying a wooden lance measuring between 8 to 10 feet. They practiced tirelessly to become adept at using it on horseback. A knight was also a master of the sword, wielding a hefty blade up to 40 inches long. The ability to fight effectively for an extended period was paramount. Speed and agility in heavy metal armor were equally crucial. Mastery of additional weapons, such as a dagger, battleaxe, mace, bow, and crossbow, was highly advantageous. A knight's armor underwent an evolution. Beginning in the 9th century, it was constructed of chain mail, formed from interconnected iron rings. This included a hooded coat, trousers, gloves, and even shoes. The full mail suit could weigh up to 30 pounds. It provided comprehensive protection, leaving only the face exposed. In the 14th century, plate armor emerged as a better defense against arrows and sword blows. Plates came in diverse shapes and designs, held together with laces, straps, hinges, buckles, or semicircular rivets. A full plate armor set weighed 45 to 55 pounds, significantly lighter than the equipment of a modern infantryman. Combining mail and plate armor was not uncommon, and most knights chose their protective gear based on their preferences, with chest plates and greaves for the legs being the most commonly worn pieces. The knight's head was guarded by a helmet, evolving over the centuries. Starting as simple conical helmets, they eventually acquired nose guards or masks. 
By the 13th century, fully enclosed helmets were commonplace, often with extra features such as protruding snouts for better ventilation. Helmets could be personalized, with punched ventilation holes, intricate designs, and even adorned with exotic plumes or three-dimensional figures representing various symbols. The importance of horses in making knights the tanks of the medieval battlefield is undeniable. They, too, had their armor. The most basic form was a cloth caparison that could cover the head and ears. For more substantial protection, a two-piece chain mail coat, one for the front and one for behind the saddle, a padded helmet for the horse, a plate head cover, or a metal or boiled leather chest plate was used to shield the faithful steed. To wield their weapons effectively and adapt to the cumbersome armor, knights needed rigorous training. Special training devices, like the quintum, a rotating arm with a shield at one end and a weight at the other, allowed knights to develop their skill. They had to strike the shield and continue riding to avoid the swinging weight, preventing it from striking them in the back. Another exercise involved removing a suspended ring with the tip of a lance while riding at full gallop. Additionally, practicing with a sword on a pell or a wooden post was a common training technique. All of these skills prepared knights for their primary roles, whether serving as bodyguards, guarding castles, or charging into battle as elite warriors. Some knights operated as independent mercenaries, while others sought adventure in the crusades that punctuated medieval European history. For the most devout, joining a military order, like the Knights Hospitaller or the Knights Templar, offered an opportunity to live a life akin to that of a monk while receiving the finest training and equipment available to medieval knights. When not engaged in active warfare, knights honed their skills and entertained the masses by participating in tournaments. These events took two main forms, the melee, a mock cavalry battle where knights captured each other for a ransom, and the joust, where two knights charged each other with lances. In jousts, knights, shielded in full armor, would ride towards each other at full gallop, aiming to unseat their opponent. To reduce the risk of injury, lances were adapted with three-pointed heads and swords were blunted. Tournaments were grand spectacles where knights showcased their chivalry, dressing up as characters from the round table or ancient myths, often for the amusement of local noblewomen. Tournaments eventually became prestigious competitions with valuable prizes for the winners. Many knights began to train specifically for these events, evolving into professional tournament players, emphasizing the tournament's role as an arena for both skill and entertainment. In the vibrant tapestry of medieval life, knights were among the most dedicated followers of fashion. They exuded a sense of style that often overshadowed other professions like the clergy. Although clothing was somewhat similar across social classes, the wealthier knights showcased the finest materials and tailoring. It's worth noting that clothing was considered taxable property and a significant status symbol. Knights adorned themselves with an array of garments, tunics of varying lengths, stockings, cloaks, gloves, and hats in various shapes. Quality mattered, and those who could afford it wore materials like silk, brocade, camel hair, and even furs. Wool was the most common fabric, but the elite flaunted bright, eye-catching colors such as crimson, blue, yellow, green, and purple. It was all about individuality, and knights bedecked their clothing with metal embellishments, gold and silver stitching, buttons, jewels, glass cobachons, feathers, and intricate embroidery. Belt buckles and shoulder brooches for fastening cloaks were especially popular for flaunting a bit of extravagance. A well-dressed knight of the Middle Ages was easily recognizable, parading flamboyant tastes with the means to indulge them. When not engaged in the rigors of knighthood, leisure beckoned. The most common pastime for knights was hunting. Beat keepers and dog handlers, accompanied by leashed hounds, tracked animals in forests or protected deer parks. Upon a signal, the hunt began, and knights, along with their pack of dogs, pursued game like deer, boars, wolves, foxes, and hares. The opportunity to make the final kill using a lance or bow was a privilege bestowed upon the nobleman when the prey was cornered. Falconry was another favored pursuit. In an era without firearms, falcons were the only way to capture birds that flew beyond the archer's reach. Falconry held a certain mystique for medieval nobility, extending beyond practicality. The preferred birds of choice were the gefalcon, peregrine, goshawk, sparrowhawk, and others, targeting forest birds, cranes, ducks, and more. Knights embodied the code of chivalry. This ethical, religious, 
and social code permeated medieval society, becoming increasingly important with the rise of romantic literature extolling the virtues of chivalry. Knights were expected to uphold essential chivalric qualities, courage, military prowess, honor, loyalty, justice, good manners, and generosity, especially to the less fortunate. Maintaining a good reputation and gaining favor with those in power hinged on displaying these virtues, failing to do so could lead to disgrace, symbolized by the removal of a knight's spurs, destruction of their armor, and alteration of their coat of arms to bear a shameful symbol or be displayed upside down. The medieval world placed the utmost importance on chivalric conduct. When a knight's days on the battlefield came to an end, joining a military order was a common practice. This ensured a honorable final resting place in one of their cemeteries or even within their churches. For instance, Sir William Marshall, a notable knight, became a Knight Templar at the last moment and was interred in the Temple Church in London. Effigies of knights, often portrayed in full armor and bearing a shield, can be found in many churches across Europe. These stone carvings serve as invaluable records of medieval weapons and armor and pay homage to the reverence knights enjoyed during the Middle Ages.